My name is Seema Anand. I'm a doctor of narrative practice, specializing in storytelling. So I'm a professional storyteller. And you were born in India? I'm born in India, yes. And I moved here about 28 years ago after I got married. So um, yes, I basically went to school and university there to start with and further studies were done here. So how did you get involved in storytelling? Do you know, it's a question that I get asked all the time. And every time I get asked this question, I really try and look for the answer, but I haven't yet managed to find the answer. I was always keen on narrative, on stories. So my, um, my BA was in English honors, which is, you know, the, a lot of the Greek and Roman myths, a lot of the stories, the way they're written. To me, it was about the power of the person telling the story and the power of the story and what it meant. And I think it gradually, organically moved into the exploration of how people communicate their stories through a language that is not their own. So I, I worked for a long time, uh, about five years to get research. Um, I worked as a tour guide to get research on oral traditions uh, when I was studying for my MPhil. And it was amazing because um, I would take groups of different people around Europe and communicate those stories in English. So the, the Europeans, it's not their first language. And for a lot of the people who are going there, it's not their first language, but how that comes together. So the oral traditions always fascinated me. Then I had my children and I stopped working. I wanted to be at home with them. And then I had my third child because I kept thinking I'll wait till they grow up. And when I had my third child quite late, I thought, I better go back to work now, otherwise I'll be very old, I'll be on my Zimmer frame by the time she grows up. And so I went back to studying and I think I automatically at that point fell into storytelling. I, I don't like to use the word fell into because I almost feel as if I'm bringing the art form, I'm sort of reducing the importance of the art form. But that's not what I mean when I say that. I think to me it was a natural progression. Um, so I went back into training, into studying, and... There, there are great oral traditions in India, of course, but you've just spoken mainly about the European ones. What about your Indian experience? So, you know, storytelling is a huge tradition from India, which is dead. It's completely lost. The only way it exists now in India, and it's making a comeback, but for all of the years that I was growing up, there was no such thing as storytelling, except for maybe your grandmother telling my grandmother was um, a medic she was a psychologist and uh, my grandfather was a doctor too so my grandparents were not the kind that stayed at home and told stories i had to tell myself the stories or how the maid at home might tell you certain stories but the tradition of storytelling as we know it as an urban art form does not exist in india it is a rural novelty it's making a comeback I've just been to Delhi now for a storytelling festival. There are many of them now starting to come up. But I did not grow up with an Indian storytelling tradition. When, but, sorry. Sorry, you spoke about the rural novelty. Now, that's interesting. Why did you describe because it in those terms? Because it, there are a lot of the old um, villages and certain areas of India where they have specific ways of telling stories. Some will sing them, some will recite them, some will chant them, some will use certain other props for them. But it, when we watched it, it was always the people from these villages would come to the big city and it was a novelty factor. We would go and watch them because, you know, you may not understand what they were saying. I just went to this storytelling festival and before me, there was, two, there was a duo from Manipur who'd come to perform a traditional style of storytelling, which is very popular where they come from. They did it in Manipuri. And they do it in a particular way, which is a little bit unusual. I thought it was fascinating just to watch. Most people were very, very disappointed with it because the, the way it's done is there are two men who sit over there. They don't meet, they don't make eye contact with the audience and they don't make eye contact with each other. And they talk in a chant. So you don't really know what they're trying to get at. And they, they, what I found fascinating was they, they have a bolster that they use as their prop. So the bolster is banged down as a mace of beam in the Mahabharata. The bolster is used as the bow and arrow of Ram. You know, it's, the bolster is used as the prop for everything, nothing else. 
And I thought it was quite interesting, but 45 minutes of listening to somebody chanting with no facial expression and no eye contact is very hard for anybody to take. So it is still something that they haven't developed. But in a sense, it's like theatre, um, because you know, actors don't necessarily, when they're performing a play, look at the audience eye to eye, and then they're very much within a ritual of a style like say katakali for example, mm -hmm. and if you don't understand Sanskrit or Mayala, 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 Malayalam, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know you you won't understand it. But would it, do you think that's a precursor of that? A katakali would be different. One is I think if there's anybody there that doesn't particularly is not particularly um, able to understand the masks and the costumes are fabulous, and also there's a certain amount of movement. Now. I don't think that you need to have movement when you're doing a storytelling. I can sit in one place and tell a story from one position for an hour. But I do think that there are certain things that the audience expect. They are, to me, storytelling is a visual art as well as an audio art. It's not just about listening, it's about watching the storyteller. You have to have something to watch. So that leads me to the question of audiences and what audiences you aim to contact and, and, and do your work for. And also perhaps it's quite interesting to actually perhaps consider the Manipurian people, how, what audiences they, they were doing this for, and the Katakali, what audiences. Um, so you've got different audiences. I mean, how do you feel about that? I absolutely love working with different audiences because what I find with storytelling is the story changes unlike in a play where you learn your lines you perform it on stage the story changes with the audience not hugely but ever so slightly and as you grow in the ability to tell a story well you acquire it's not something that you're born with you acquire a certain level of relaxation where you can take what the audience is saying and incorporate it into your story. And that takes a great deal of practice, a great deal of working at it, and many, many years of working at it, to be able to find the comfort zone to be able to do it. And, you know, include a little bit of what they say, make them a part of it, give them ownership of it, and then move back into your story. So the stories that I started with when I started to work, I've always worked mostly with adults. Now I do a lot of stuff with children or with mixed audiences, but my stories are more about information. So I don't work with very young children. It, uh, to me, the story is fascinating because of the information it represents, the, the culture, the legend, the mythology, the customs of the people. Um, for me, that's very important. The Manipur, the Manipur duo, who personally I thought were great, the, the morning session that we did, we did an education session. So we had a group of, um, I'm trying to remember, about 50 girls from uh, a government school nearby. So this was a Hindi-speaking audience. And they must have been, I don't know, about, uh, the girls must have been about 14 years, 15 years of age. They were lovely, they were beautifully well behaved. But they didn't get it, unfortunately. And the person who was trying to introduce the um, story, uh, introduce the item, was not a storyteller. So he was actually stepping in because he spoke Hindi and English plus Manipuri. So he explained what they were talking about. And if you know basically what the story of the Mahabharata is, you could kind of follow what they were doing. But I really believe that if you're going to tell a story, you have to be able to capture the imaginations of the audience. You have to, whether they can understand you or not, they have to be with you somewhere in this land of fantasy. And if they're not there, unfortunately, you haven't been able to tell the story the way it should be told. So this comes to the question of your positioning and how you position yourself in context of this society and how other people position you. I mean, you come from India and um, are you considered South Asian in any way, or do you reject that? That's an interesting question. And I think it's, um, it's one of those things that's not written in stone. It's, it's very mobile, My, you know, the identity that we bring. So I grew up in India, and when I was growing up, 
when I did my BA, which was in English honors, we did not have a single Indian book on our syllabus, a single Indian author, I beg your pardon, on our syllabus. So I studied everything from the Bible, which I can recite backwards to you, the book of Job particularly. Um, I did the classics. I can tell you all about Milton's Paradise Lost, which was my favorite um, book. Chaucer, Yeats, Browning, uh, uh, you, you know, we did the Victorians, we did the Americans, we did pretty much everybody. We, we studied Conrad, we studied D.H. Lawrence. It was a huge spectrum, not a single Asian author. Today, 25 years down the line, 30 years down the line, things have changed. So now they've introduced Rabindranath Tagore into the syllabus, etc. So when I was growing up, um, we tended to study the classics. Greek and Roman mythology was at the top of the list. The classics, Shakespeare was very important. I didn't grow up, I grew up in colonial India, or post-colonial, but it's very much, you know, the thinking was still very colonial. So when I came over here, I found that I understood the language, the literature, the, the way of thinking, the humor of the people over here. Subsequently, I have now studied the Vedas. I have now studied the Asian background of literature after coming over here. So it's interesting because uh, my, the way I've developed it is for a multicultural audience, which means that, and I'm not just, say, I, to me a multicultural audience is not just the non-Indians when they listen to an Indian story. It is also the Indians of my generation. And it's also the, the new Asians growing up in this country. They don't really have the same knowledge of our background of literature and stories, basically because they didn't exist when we were growing up. Um, no, that's the wrong thing to say. They did exist, but they didn't exist for, um, as a mainstream thing for everybody. So we didn't pay very much attention to it. So your transnational experience really is really bound up with the Commonwealth, the British Empire, you know, and that sort of thing, the colonies, uh, you know, colonial aspect, British colonial anyway. And, um, but it's interesting that you have gone back to explore what you, uh, your, your roots, I guess. It is, it's fascinating because now I come to it from a different angle. So I'm not carrying the baggage of previous knowledge and I can actually explore it as a philosophy as it's meant to be explored and it's fantastic, I'm loving it. And I now have more of a South Asian identity than I did when I arrived here. Um, simply because it's, it's not deliberate, it's just that I'm seen as Indian. I'm seen as somebody who knows a fair amount about the Indian um, literature and stories. And I get asked to do a lot of the work around that area. So I'm acquiring more of a South Asian identity through the work that I have, um, well, tried to gain an expertise in. And how important is that to you? Because in a sense, you're the real thing, having come from India, even though you are not brought up with um, the, the Asian um, literature, um, you must still have some kind of reference points that are quite deep. You're absolutely right. You grow up with all the stories, even if you're not brought up with the specific literature, you grow up with all the stories, you grow up amongst the culture, you automatically grow up with certain things. How important is it for me? Um, I think it's just part of me. I don't, I cannot actually say that it's a role I take on or put off. I have three children, they were born in this country. They go back often enough to know that that is where we come from and what happens over there. But they're very, very British Asian. They're very British in their ways. But they're growing up with both things because they have family there, they have family here. And I, I don't think that it's an identity that I um, divide. So you, there must be a common thread between all the stories um, that say the British, I mean, you as a storyteller would know that best, you know, that with the work that British Asians are doing here in theatre, in storytelling, and on TV and the media, there must be a connecting thread, somehow a common thread that kind of defines it as um, British Asian or Asian. 
I think everyone's um, interpretation of Asian or British Asian is different. Uh, I guess there must be a common thread, maybe, maybe it's geographical. I, I don't know. I, I have to say that I, I think that to actually pin it down to one thing would be to do it a disservice because I think it's so wide. And the arts are so much a part of your imagination, your, your mind, that I think pinning it down would, I, I don't think it would be the right thing to do. But in terms of the way I find um, expression for my work, is literally, I have learned, like I said, to do this for a multicultural audience because we today, I think every individual is a multicultural person today. Everyone's identity is multicultural. And when you tell a story, it has to make sense to everybody. They have to get ownership for it at some level. So I'm just working on a project for the British Museum on um, their Colombian stories. So I'm going to be doing stories about El Dorado, which I'm very excited about. But I will take the Colombian stories, but I will reinterpret them so that when they're told, they make sense. They're not so specific and they're not so A-specific but somewhere in the middle. I, sorry, I was just going to say in India when I was there, actually the reason that I went was because the Polish embassy asked me to come and do Polish stories. So what I was doing there was actually Polish legends for the Indian public. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> and so um, you're talking just now earlier on <clears throat> between ourselves that you, are, um, you, know, you have to be adaptable as a storyteller because any then you do go to any situation that you go to. In a sense, you're creating a theater, mm -hmm. uh, and, and you're inviting the audience to be part of this. Mm -hmm. So where do you see the connect, or how do you see the connect between your work and what's more traditional theater, proscenium arch theaters in theater venues? OK, so um, there is an old, old book, the very first book written in Sanskrit on the art of theater, um, the Natya Shastra. And the Natya Shastra lists storytelling as the first form of theatre. So really, I see it as a genre of theatre. It's slightly more intimate theatre. So even if you're telling a story for 30,000 people, you have to do it in a slightly different form because it's known as intimate theatre. So the, it's going to sound strange, but the makeup that you would wear for storytelling is slightly different. You have to look more like somebody who might just be sitting in your audience. In, the, in terms of, the, you know, you can't have the heavy makeup of a dancer or somebody on stage with the big lights on. Um, what is the connect? It is, I think it's just a different way of putting the same story across. With mine, because it's me normally on my own, if there's a budget, we have dancers with us, we have other people with us, we have musicians, artists. I've worked across the board with different types of art forms. I think it's the same at some level, the same story. It just depends on which story you choose to tell. So in a sense, there's some kind of neutral um, persona that you, 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 are, you, you have as a storyteller. You then become both playwright and performer in one. You do, and the, the, um, it says as a storyteller, you have to be neutral to what is happening. So you're not allowed to veer the audience towards what they should like and what they shouldn't like. You're supposed to present it. It's very difficult. One is human after all. You know, we tend to sort of present a viewpoint. But the idea of the storyteller is almost that of the, um, the Greek chorus in the play. It's the person, the narrator, telling you what is actually happening. And as a narrative practitioner, my point is to try and get the imagination fired. So even if I'm talking about a really, really complicated subject, trying to bring it down to a way that's really easy for somebody else to pick up, build up enough interest for them in that subject so that they go off and explore it. So your artistic journey, you must have seen quite, or felt quite a change in yourself because of what you've just been saying about how you kind of journeyed back to India for your information and material. Um, how did you, as an artist, therefore, embark on this artistic journey, and how did, where did this artistic journey take you? Ah, 
Okay, so I think one of the joys that it's it's taken me to, it's literally, I, I, I call it the land of joy, is the ability to explore the traditions. I mean, I think I was just born to live in stories. You know, the, just come into the wrong place where I'm a wife and a mother and a housekeeper and trying to look after a house. Really, I think I should just be living in stories. Um, where has it taken me? It's actually opened up an incredible field. Okay, so one of the things that I always think of when I think of myself developing as a storyteller. As a storyteller, when you, um, you have to, you, you play your story or you tell your story from the uh, energy of the audience. And you cannot always see your audience because some places you go and they've got the audience in the dark. And you learn to listen out for the audience reaction or you look at their faces and you learn to pick up emotion because you change your story accordingly. And that's an amazing gift that, that's been brought to me, I think, is the fact that it has brought brought me so much more in tune with auras or with with personas or with um, with just the energies really with the energies of people and so how but how did your family and your friends um, regard the storyteller in their midst developing i think initially there was a lot of skepticism from everybody and then there was this thing of what on earth, I still get it actually from a lot of people, what on earth does that mean? But I have to say that I was very fortunate because um, the kids, my children and my husband have been there along the way to sort of hold the fort. Because the other thing you find as you start to become a performer, you're an artist, you'll know what I'm talking about, and you start to open yourself up to everything that you're creating, you become more and more vulnerable as a person. So they have actually been that little sort of soft cushion for me to go back to, to recoup the energies, to recoup the emotions. And I think that's what's really, it's really, really important. And if you're, if you're lucky enough to have that. So you have great support. Great support emotionally, because that's what you really need is somebody, you know, when you, when you create a story and you deliver it, it's like delivering your own baby. It's very hard to think of that baby not being appreciated by everybody. And I guess that's the same with anybody who's performing a dance or creating a painting. So, and there's always going to be somebody or something in that story that somebody does not like. It is very, very important for a storyteller to be able to move forward, to have somewhere to go to, to recoup those energies, to be able to take the criticism that you need to take to actually improve yourself. So I think that's been really useful, very helpful. Um, I have had a lot of, um, I've also had some very dear friends who've been supportive by being completely criti critical. Now that sounds very strange because I, I know that a couple of my friends who we won't talk about, who are known to other people as well, and they're known for being, cri being thoroughly, thoroughly critical. So this one particular friend who has played a huge part in my development has never ever come to me and said, I love your work as a storyteller. She will always say to me, what on earth does this mean? What do you mean storytelling? You have so much more capability. Why are you a storyteller? Don't be so silly. So it's just literally a case of trying to get over her criticisms that's made me go further. I, I wouldn't suggest that kind of thing for everybody because it's not very easy to take and handle. You have to have, you know, um, a fairly strong personality to be able to get, uh, take that sort of criticism. But I've had people who are not interested at all. You know, so it, isn't, it hasn't always been wonderful and everybody's sort of been over there supporting me and cheering me on. I've had people say, oh, but this isn't really something we're interested in. And I know that if they were to come once for the storytelling, they would be converts, they would be converted. But everybody hasn't always been there. So you have to find your own energies and your own sort of reason to go forward. So in a sense, um, you're talking about vulnerability just now. You are in this very vulnerable situation and the people are saying things about you. It kind of drives you to almost at a point of trauma, it? it's a traumatic abyss somehow, which you have to then 
climb out of mm -hmm. if you happen to tip over into it. Um, so this kind of balance is also um, quite a wonderful source, I think, of emotional um, portrayal, I guess, um, you know, inhabiting the characters' lives, the characters that you're, 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 you're telling stories about. How, uh, you mentioned quite, quite well in how you, you use that criticism in a very um, positive way. But um, did you yourself in any way um, ever suffer from that and then really had to dig yourself out of it? through your storytelling? I think, um, like I said, we all feel a certain level of vulnerability, vulnerability. We all feel a certain level of, oh God, that didn't go according to plan. I also have this wonderful um, support system that I can turn to. I was taught one thing by somebody. Um, the first thing was that when I was, when I'd sit down to tell stories, I would tend to focus, I'd have all these smiling faces around me. By and large, people love stories. And if you're good, people love the story even more. There would always be a couple of people who didn't have a big smile on their face. And I would focus on those people's faces because I wanted to bring a smile to their face. And I would work really hard and I would destroy myself emotionally because a lot of times I couldn't get them to change their expression. It was only much later that I was taught not everybody smiles. Some people, that is their expression. They love what you're doing, but they show it in their own way. So now to get my energy, I focus on the people who've got the biggest smiles on their face. So I get a lot of energy from that. That was one thing. Another thing was the moment I would finish, my brain would have registered the bits that I felt didn't go fabulously well. And as soon as I'd finish, I'd go, oh my God, that was awful. And again, I was taught by a very dear friend, when you finish something, you never say about yourself, that was awful. You say, oh, that was amazing. Because it does change everybody's perception of it. Unless, of course, it's terribly, terribly bad, which is a whole different thing. But people are ready to be happy. People are ready to be amused. People are ready to be delighted with what they've watched. And most people, in an, in an oral narrative, won't actually remember those couple of little bits that, according to you, have not gone according to plan. So those are two wonderful things that I was taught. Which is great, because as a solo performer, you have no support from a cast or a technical crew or a director. <laughs> Absolutely. As a matter of fact, um, you know, in India, there's an organization called Spick McKay. I don't know if you've come across them. They basically... Um, it's a festival that happens twice a year and it's an arts and cultural based festival. So they do lots of um, performances. They invite lots of different types of artists to do different things. And they had come to watch one of the stories that I was doing when I was in India. And this lady came to me at the end and she said, she said, you know, when we came and sat down and I looked around and I saw that the stage was not decorated and there were no props and there was nothing over here to make it look beautiful. And she said, I was thinking, oh my God, this is going to be really awful. And I couldn't get out of it because I sat in the middle. And she said, I'm so glad I stayed because it was absolutely fantastic. And I won't judge the performance by the setting anymore. So, yeah. And now there's a lot of um, the South Asian theater. Um, it's very issue based. Well, it started off with, with Tara Arts, you know, Richard mm -hmm. Verma. Um, as a response to a racist killing. Um, how do you involve this, these kind of issues in the stories that you tell? Okay, so again, it depends. Um, recently, I've been working on the stories of the Hamza Nama. The Hamza Nama is part of the Persian style of, st traditionally it's told, told in the Persian style, the Dastan Roy style. Traditionally, only men are supposed to tell that story you bring about a certain change according to what you see around you. I'm a great believer in the fact that if you're going to tell a story, you need to be able to tell it without hammering home a point. But I do work with a lot of the narrative. I really believe that we are a collection of stories, you know, so we are the stories that we tell and the stories that we believe and the stories that we ignore. And those are the stories that so all the issues, for instance, I've been working on women's narratives 
for many, many years now. So my way of addressing the issues of what is going on is literally using the stories or the narratives that exist. And to me, I've also discovered what's very important is I might tell a very modern story um, of something that's happening. I try not to write new stories to tell. I'm not interested in doing that. As a storyteller, I feel that it's important to go into the bank of stories that exist. So use the stuff that's already there. Um, and I find that it's very important to sort of correlate the modern with the ancient. Because certainly with women's narratives, nothing has changed. Whether you tell a story from 5,000 years ago, very little today has changed in the lives and the status and the identities and the stories of women. So um, it's the same, like you said, you know, with theatre, you, you take an issue-based point. And I've been doing a lot of work for the um, different women's organisations, doing a lot of talks for them on... Um, stories that exist and how they're told and what is the power that those stories have over people. And I always say that if we're going to actually change social issues, you have to change the stories that you tell. You have to start changing the stories. And one of the things I will say as my own um, thing with women's stories, I know that there are, there are a lot of women's stories which are about the trauma and the, the awful stuff that has happened to women. But I think it's time to start telling happier, stronger stories. Maybe we start listening to them, we start believing them. And how, how do you feel, therefore, the state of theatre is today from what you see around you mm -hmm. um, in, in the British Asian sector? Have you seen any changes? You know, what have you, in a sense, your contribution to it? I mean, I'm, I'm not talking about just theatre in theatre venues, mm -hmm. but theatre in a broad sense. I think one of the biggest changes actually in theatre that I've noticed is because of the lack of funds. And so people have become really, um, I think they've been absolutely amazing, the kind of stuff, the improvisation that has happened to develop new types of theatre. Um, did you watch that, what was it called, Behna? It was a kitchen, it's kitchen theatre. You know, there was this group who put together a play and the play pretty much happens in the kitchen, so they would go to people's houses and the audience would sit in the kitchen and the play would take place in the kitchen. I thought it was fantastic. It was absolutely brilliant and it addressed all the issues and so on. You have, um, you know, the, the promenade theatre, which is great, because, but I guess it's a little bit more of a spectacle. It's more spectacular because you have to sort of encompass and incorporate the audiences who are just walking along on the street. Um, you can't really always get their attention. There has been some incredible development. I also find that some of it has become a little too, uh, you know, absurdist. It's sort of very Godot-esque. So it's gone from postmodern to whatever happened in the middle back to going postmodern. And I'm not entirely certain that a lot of that makes sense to everybody. Certainly, I, I know that there's a certain level of um, theatre that's being done where it, it's, it's so deep that as the audience, you don't really get it till the director explains it afterwards. I have to say, I like to be able to watch things that I, un I understand while I'm watching them. So um, theatre has developed in all sorts of ways and I think people are trying to find new ways of putting something across. So going back to your own practice, where you, you had that, you kind of talked about the division, really, or you didn't, you mentioned that this, this kind of the rural, the rural mm -hmm. novelty and the, sort of the city, the urban setting. Have you yourself actually gone into any rural settings to, to, to play out your stories? I have done some storytelling in a couple of rural settings. Um, not very much, I have to say, because I think a lot of times what happens is it's got to be funded by somebody else who's doing um, the project and by the time that project is taken forward, for instance, the British Council do some amazing work of taking storytellers across. But a lot of it doesn't go into the village settings. 
it does go into the cities. Um, so in answer to your question, I've done a little bit, but not very much. I was part of um, a corporate CSR, uh, corporate, uh, corporate social responsibility project where we were going to take storytelling into the rural areas to get people to understand how to tell their stories, understand it as a skill that might then make them some money. So actually give it to them as a skill which would then be a money spinner. Um, whether it would be something that the entire village would come together and do etc. And that project has had so many hiccups that it hasn't gotten very far. But it would be wonderful to be able to go and help people to tell stories in a way that they can actually bring their art form out to be able to earn money out of it. Now, I was thinking about this because you, you talked about a kitchen setting. So I was thinking, what is a rural setting today, you know? And therefore, how would you, as a storyteller, because you're quite flexible as mm -hmm. an artist, you could go anywhere and spin your stories, you know? Mm -hmm. um, kitchens also happen in rural areas. They're also based in, located in rural are areas. So in a sense, um, it, there, there's no difference, really. It's just perception of audience, isn't it? it? It's not so much the fact that it's the kitchen, whether it was a kitchen in town or a kitchen in a village. It was about the audiences. So when you get urban city audiences, young professionals, people who would not normally use this as a form of theatre or somewhere to, or consider it as a, as a form of entertainment. I'm talking about actually opening it up to them. Uh, because a lot of them, I mean, I know that I work with a lot of Asian audiences and a lot of the time, the times the women will come because they, I find the women are very open to new ideas. The men won't, especially the, the high-powered corporate men, you know, the ones, the hedge fund people or the big-time bankers, they will not come and the wives will always say, oh, no, you know, he wouldn't do something like this. This is not really him. They would go to see a film. They would go to the theater. This is something that needs to be opened up as well. And you have to be able to see the point of a story, the, the, the fact that a story is not just for little children. It's actually a form of entertainment, it can be for anybody. So casting back, could you tell us which of your previous work you feel has the most importance for you, that you've done something? Oh, I don't know if I could actually. So the work that I'm doing at the moment, which I absolutely adore, is from the Hamza Nama. And the Hamza Nama was written in the 1500s for Emperor Akbar in India. Um, but it's part of a very old tale, a 2,000 year old tale. Hamza was the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad. And so this is a story about his adventures and it's a fabulous book. And I love this particular epic because this is the one story where the storytellers don't have to stick to the story. They can take the basic idea of the story and recreate the story as they want. So it's one of the very few books in the world that gives you that kind of luxury. So I love that because um, it was written traditionally in, in Urdu, in Persian. There's a lot of amazing poetry. There's a lot of amazing language. The stories are very funny. The potential is amazing. And like I said, traditionally it was only told by men. So the fact that there are a couple of women, I think at this point there are only two women that I know of, myself and an Iranian lady, who do these stories in the traditional way, but in English. Um, so that's a huge um, thing for me. Another piece of my work which I absolutely love and I want to expand eventually is the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is um, one of the, it's now considered a religious text. It is actually a text of stories about Krishna. And most people cr uh, consider it, it's written in verse, so it's written as philosophy, it's recited as philosophy, it's um, talked about by all the big gurus, the philosophers, but originally it was written as stories. And I want to rewrite that book as stories because it has such potential. I think it's so fantastic. So I'd like to go back. They're just really fun stories and I want to go back and do that. And the third thing that I've been wanting to do for a long time and never got around to is to recreate the Mahabharata as a management tool. 
because oh, that's something I've been working on for a long time. That's fantastic. Is there anything else you'd like to talk to us about, tell us about that you've, I've left, we've left out? Is there something really important? No, I think just to finish with saying that um, I think storytelling is um, generally a, mis a misconstrued art form because a lot of people will say to me, oh, will you just come and do a story over here and you don't need time to prepare this. You can just come and stand over here and do this. And I think that we really need to work to bring it back to the kind of status and the importance that it deserves. So people understand what kind of work goes into the creating of a story and how important it is for us to bring it back. Thank you, Seema. <laughs>